Hello. This is this is good for everyone. Okay. Yeah. So uh, uh, we're uh, again running a little behind here, so we're uh, offset by a little bit. Our next speaker is uh, Gerardo Paz Silva. He'll be talking about DD and quantum error correction. Hi. So um, since we we have been listening about um, the issue of combining quantum error correction and maybe dynamical decoupling, uh, would be some work we have been some problem we have been working on with Daniel and here at USC. So let me give you some motivation first of, well, essentially this actually, before I mention, if you, if you like um, DD acronism, this is what we call SXDD, where X stands for whatever you want. But anyway, so let me give you some motivation. Here you have your quantum computer, which is ruled by some uh, Hamiltonian evolution, uh, well, H of S, which I guess is a font issue, but anyway. And um, I will just sweep to the Good. So we have our, um, our quantum computer with ru ruled by some Hamiltonian. And then, of course, we have the bath. And the bath is really, you can think of it as a big furnace, which is trying to heat up your, your computer. And the problem, of course, is that there is this system bath coupling, which is trying to essentially kill your computation. Fortunately, we have seen that you can actually isolate your computer using quantum error correction techniques and fault tolerance. And that, all, that is, of course, very good. But the problem is that if your the heat, the amount of heat that is coming in or the the size of this HSB is too large, then suddenly fault tolerance is not too effective and it actually fails. Or you can, you can also think about this, that maybe your, your quantum correction and your fault tolerance still works, but then you, you require a lot of resources to do that. So the, 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 I guess another thing is, well, can you actually add another filter to this heat? Can you put another uh, lower level of protection, in this case, in the form of dynamical decoupling, that you can actually reduce the effective heat that the quantum error correction sees? in such a way that you can still either achieve the fault tolerance that um, you could not before, or actually reduce the number of, the amount of resources you actually need. So let us start like more to the point, which what is uh, the scenario we are thinking of. So essentially we have a quantum computer, uh, let's say encoded in some NKD code, where N is the number of your physical qubits, so the, like the number of actual qubits you need in your experiment. K is just the number of logical qubits, and D is just the distance or the capacity of how many errors, what well, this is related to how many errors you can recover from. So initially, you have, we are going to consider the case where you have a Hamiltonian, uh, which has a, a part which is like purely bad. In reality, you can actually relax a bit this assumption and say that it's not only bad, but well, it actually doesn't have to act as identity on your system, but maybe with some unless uh, operator. But for now, let's consider that this is just identity. And then you have the system bad Hamiltonian, which can have terms that act only in the system or also in the system and the bath. But the point is that they are harmful. They are terms that you really don't like, right? So, in reality, this all this goes for some unitary over some, let's say, let's call it a tau minimum, and uh, it will make sense afterwards why this is a minimum. But uh, this, so this is just a traditional unitary evolution. And you can actually quantify, um, like you can some effective error rate uh, via this uh, this expression, where this is just the norm of your system bath uh, Hamiltonian times the, the, the time it um, it takes to make to do execute the gate. So what we want to do when you when you do um, dynamical decoupling is actually well. I want to take, even if I take longer, I want to have a new um, unitary evolution, which is, has two distinct terms. Um, the first one is this H naught or H uh, empty, if you want. Uh, well, depending on who you ask, but anyway. So this, uh, H, um, this H idea is that this guy is harmless to your system. So if you think about it in terms of error correction, it could be that this H naught includes, let's say, a stabilizer operator. So if it's a stabilizer operator, you are pretty good, right? Because um, your information is, uh, well, is not harmed by such operators. And you can actually now measure that effective error rate again in this scenario of some, um, when you have achieved some, let's say some dynamical decoupling of order N, and then this, of course, is just a norm of this um, other term that you, you have there. So the hope, of course, is that at some point you can show that um, the actual uh, effective error rate when you use dynamical decoupling despite the gate take or the operation taking longer, then essentially it's smaller than the bare error rate. So this is all good, and this is essentially what we want to, we would like to show. So there have been some work done in this, uh, done in this direction, and this was what uh, Daniel was talking about this morning. So in this paper, uh, the, let's call it the NLP paper for simplicity, they showed that you could actually show the um, uh, enhanced fidelity calculates, 
And the main, the, the main idea is that, well, you can think of applying simultaneously dynamical decoupling gates on each of the qubits of your computer. And well, this is, of course, a very good idea. The issue is, of course, that for this to work, well, in, in principle, you cannot, in this scenario, regardless of how local you assume your HSB to be, you cannot achieve arbitrary order decoupling. And the main reason is that if you look at the Magnus expansion, then you will see that eventually your qubits will give you, will give rise to terms which actually commute with all your operators, and then you are kind of in, a bad, in bad shape. So to overcome this problem, um, part of the, uh, main, or in part to overcome the problem, they introduced what it's called the local bath assumption. And essentially this guarantees that higher order Magnus terms never gave rise to, term, to actually Hamiltonian, effective Hamiltonian terms that you cannot deal with, with higher levels of uh, DD concatenation. So you can act actually, in fact, well, the, okay, maybe the issue is that, of course, this local bus assumption is not maybe as general as, as the most um, comprehensive fault tolerance error models that you can think of. In any way, you can actually um, think, well, uh, is there any other solution to this problem? Can we actually go over the um, no local bus assumption to the, or the local bus assumption, sorry? And you can, well, you can actually, there is actually a solution. It's actually a, a straightforward solution. You can take, you can take in the, in the language of dynamical decoupling, you can take the n qubit um, Pauli basis, and or either the generator or the full group if you are doing CDD as you prefer. And uh, this is of course very good because you can achieve arbitrary order. However, there are maybe a, a couple of caveats that, uh, well, maybe they eventually may be uh, important. The important is, well, they, they grow uh, exponentially as a, as a function of 2n, which where n is, we, we recall n is the number of physical qubits. And not only that, but the poles look, the pulses themselves, although at the end you, can, you might say, well, because I'm doing the whole group, at the end they, I'm applying uh, effectively no operation at the end of the day, but every, every pulse itself is, may look as an error to the code. So it may limit in principle the, some integration with other um, quantum error correction based um, approaches. So what we actually want is, well, we'll say we want to choose the right group, right? We want to choose a correct dynamical, uh, the right dynamical decoupling sequence in such a way that we need no extra locality assumptions, that the pulses rely lie on the code, that they do not look like errors, and um, that ideally we would like to get some shorter sequences to the full decoupling approach, right? Of course, all this always only makes sense if we can achieve, we can actually show that our error rate is better, right? So let us let us keep going, and well, the main observation, of course, is that um, the magic of everything is just in the decoupling group, right? So if you, I mean, if you, you look at the problem, you say, well, if my group is too small, then it may be that uh, I cannot achieve arbitrary order decoupling, as was the case in NLP, or I may not actually be able to decouple general Hamiltonians, which, again, that would be a problem, right? And if you, the group is too large, then, as happened with the um, basis, then maybe it's an overkill. You can kill more terms than the ones you need. And uh, more importantly, well, the shorter sequence is the better, right? This is kind of the motivation. So the main tool that we are going to use here is um, this tool that was introduced in a reference that will appear here shortly, in the, it was introduced in the nested URIC dynamical decoupling scenario. And the idea is that you have the mutually orthogonal operator set. In this case, I will also uh, add the condition that is a generator set. And the idea is that there is a bunch of operators, omega i, that um, square to identity and that either commute or commute um, or anti-commute with each other. So um, this is like the main tool. And this is important actually because you can formulate both CDD and NUDD in, both in these terms. And you can actually see that you can formulate uh, concatenated dynamical decoupling using uh, the base group, the group generated actually by this um, by this generator, by these moves. And you can actually use uh, do just plain nested uh, NUDD is the same uh, the same moves. So um, so what is that we are thinking of? Well, before we I mean, reading the literature, people have thought about using the um, just the stabilizers of your of your code as um, as actual, as a decoupling group. And this was a, it's a good idea, but again, you think that, you, if you think about it, then when you do your Magnus expansion, higher order terms will may give you a logical error. And this logical error commutes with your stabilizer. So that is not good, because eventually, even if you try to go to n dynamical decoupling, to nth order de decoupling, that term will still be there. So that is kind of a problem. However, if you actually add uh, to these moves the, a set of Pauli basis elements, uh, like this is like a, a, a subscript, a superscript for the logical version of this, um, this unencoded X and encoded C. And then you can actually show that this moose is pretty, is pretty useful. Not only that, but it's a super moose. And the idea is the following, that you can still get this, you, if you write your dynamical decoupling evolution, you say, well, 
this is my, what is, what I'm, what I actually care about is what is my age not after the end of my dynamical decoupling evolution. And you can see that now the dynamical decoupling evolution is not proportional to the stabilizers of my group. And so this implies, of course, that since my, 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 my um, code is chosen such that the stabilizer is stabilized, then this is exactly harmless to, the, to, the, to my information. More importantly, I think, is that um, if you recall that when we're doing this analysis, we assume nothing on HSB. So in principle, HSB itself could contain a logical, sort of logical error type uh, Hamiltonian. And this actually, this HSB term will, will still be pushed to this, um, to the sort of decoupled part of your, um, of your evolution, right? So, so this is uh, highly beneficial, actually. And uh, so what have we gained with all this? Well, in principle, we have, uh, well, what we have gained is that, of course, there is, there is no need for an extra locality assumption because essentially our, our, dynam our base dynamical decoupling group is, up, is powerful enough that you can always decouple at every level of concatenation like all the, all the terms you actually want to decouple. So there is no term that is both undecouplable and harmful by the next um, level of concatenation. So you can, still, you can keep going I mean, to do higher order decoupling as much as you want. And well, for the NUNIDD case, uh, the, uh, there is actually this proof that we, are work, we, are, we were working on uh, with Juan and, and Daniel and Greg. And then you can actually show that the this, this same decomposition induced by the, this Immuse structure is actually very helpful. And you can show that if you have that structure, you can uh, go into, the, um, into arbitrary order decoupling with, um, with this other scheme. So now, if you see that um, the pulses we have chosen are now, uh, belong actually to the, to the group, right? And you can actually also use them to be bitwise. So they're in principle not only experimentally friendly, but they are transversal in the code. So for instance, if you to think about CSS codes, then your X logical operator, or P logical operator is now bitwise and transversal. So in principle, it respects your error model. So, and the fact that, of course, they, my pulses do not lack errors, but in principle allows for other protections, the interaction with other protection schemes. So what else have we gained? Well, let's check out, let's, let's look at the, at the cost of, in terms of uh, free time evolution, or if you want the length of your, se of your sequence. And in fact, you, you, can, you can check out that um, if the, the, the length, uh, the size of your moves is now, you can rewrite it. It would initially be the number of stabilizers plus two times the number of logical operators. But because of the stabilizer properties, you can, um, you can actually rewrite it in this way. In the case where um, there is no subsystem, then g is equal to zero. And then you see that there is a small advantage here that you have n minus k, essentially you get n plus k. However, the, maybe the more, drum, and of course this is here, in this, here I'm, I'm showing the, the cost of fully decoupling n qubits. Um, so you see that there is actually a gain. And the, the more interesting case is perhaps when you have system code, and when you have a subsystem code, and you can do, for instance, this is just a, the, um, the example of the Bacon share code, and you can see that actually the size of, your, of the full decoupling moves is actually, of course, two n squared because you have an n, n times n lattice. But if you do the XED version, because you essentially only care about the number of stabilizers, which is given by this expression, and well, the number of logical generators, because you only have one logical qubit and you only have two. So you see that you're actually gaining an order of, um, well, a power here in this, um, in the, in, the, in the size of the moves. And this is, of course, even perhaps more relevant if you think that this is actually the exponent of some quantity, regardless of what uh, higher order decoupling sequence you use. So I guess this is, um, well, this is better than the other. So, um, so we are still missing to show um, if we are actually gaining something. So we are still now to do it. So let's maybe uh, an observation I want to make is that um, at this point, we, are, we, are, we have computed the distances in terms of the um, the distance, if you think about it, is just the distance between the n qubit states, if you prefer. However, in reality, we're not truly interested in the distance between the, the physical states, the n qubit physical states, but the distance between the logical information stored there. So in principle, um, in our calculations, so this is just about the, the easiest bound we can find, but of course, we are trying to work in just um, introducing ideal decouplers, ideal decouplers or ideal error correction to mentally actually get a correct distance. But so this sort of work in progress at the moment, but nevertheless. So the problem is of course that um, thinking about this um, limitation of our calculation, thinking, uh, I must say that the error correction, the ideal error correction of the distance between the logical information will be smaller than the one I'm going to show here, but no, so this is still a good uh, proof of principle calculation. So the way of doing this is, well, we go to the NLP results, which was, um, which was, I think, actually, this, um, this experiment, sorry, I think, maybe just Q, but I mean, 
Um, so we, we essentially go to that, and what they did is that they um, they can compute the norm of the system of the system of the effective system bath and of the effective uh, not um, Hamiltonian at every level of concatenation of DD concatenation. So you can do this trick, and then essentially you can get an, an, uh, a norm of this um, of this um, the, system, the effective system bath at any level of concatenation, and of course multiplied by the corresponding uh, time of the total length of the sequence at the same level of concatenation. And the long story short is, of course, that um, this is just a power of HSB to some power. Actually, it should be, I think, Q plus one, but um, in the total thing, but regardless. Um, and the idea is, of course, that we want to compare the product of these two quantities, which is um, actually this one, with this one. So we actually go ahead and do it, and just for some particular code in this, we chose a Bacon share code for, because we already know that it has a very good scaling. And this is what we get. So this is a plot here of the, um, the log of the ratio we were showing, we were considering before. And here we have, um, we actually went through the um, recursive relationships that were in the, in the line of P paper. And this is like the first order of concatenation, second order of DD concatenation, and third order. And you see that there is actually a non-trivial interplay depending of in between the degrees of the different degrees of TD concatenation for different um, for different um, set of values for J0, um, tau min, and, and J, JSB, where of course JSB is just a norm of HSB, the physical HSB, and J0 is the norm of the physical uh, Hamiltonian we had. Right? So uh, here in this gray area, as you can see here, is where essentially where uh, there is no advantage of using DD, and you're actually hurting yourself. So it, this sort of makes sense that uh, as J0 is larger and larger, then you lose your capability. But it's essentially related to the fact that if J0 is too large, uh, well, your system is evolving too fast and DD loses, uh, loses its uh, nice properties. So um, maybe something I should say is that what we expect is that with the measuring, the, the actual distance measure, including the error correction, the error correction or the actual distance between the logical information, this graph uh, should well improve, right? But this is, of course, some um, um, speculation that requires some exact calculation. So, well, this is one point extra for us. The problem, of course, the, of this, that the fact that uh, this is limited by the actual, uh, the actual limitations of uh, DD that are related to the norm of H0 is actually a point for the, for the system bath problem. And, of course, we want to, well, of course, I should just show the memory sequence, and this will, of course, um, very, I mean, it's not terribly useful for computation. But the idea we want to, so in, in, in the graph that we showed before, is actually an implement, this actual calculation based on these um, dynamically protected gates that Daniel and, uh, talked about before, uh, where essentially you do, you append, you, instead of making just your gate, you put your dynamically developing sequences, and then that's all good. And then you can actually do the same, right? Um, however, also another possibility, which is uh, actually the, the talk before me, which was pretty useful. Um, and the idea is that you can actually repeat the same, you can actually port the same sequences to our SXDD thing, because essentially what you are saying is that, well, you have your, your favorite DD sequence and your favorite method of doing gates. Well, instead of using pulses that belong to the Pauli, the correct way, or well, the natural way of doing it within a code structure is just use your elements of the code. And they have some very good properties, but well, they're experimentally friendly, et cetera, et cetera. So I guess that's good. So in conclusion, um, well, we have shown that there is actually no need for extra locality conditions. The pulses are in the code. And the shorter sequences, um, you have shorter sequences at the full decoupling approach. So this, is the, this last point is actually um, what I was mentioning before, that we are essentially not um, demanding anything on HSP. So if you think, for instance, that the computer has a, a, a system bath um, Hamiltonian that looks like a logical operator, then you see that regardless of how powerful, I mean, if you have a QEC problem there, this logical operator cannot be dealt with because the, your stabilizer just jump over it. However, if you try to use this dynamical decoupling uh, sort of SX stabilizer DD scenario, then you can actually push this contribution to higher orders in time in such a way that QEC can take over from whatever DD leaves, leaves it, right? And um, well, and this is well essentially just the observation I had made before. And uh, what we are trying to do now is actually doing this calculation I was talking about um, of actually including the, um, the effect, or actually the, the power in, induced by the code that, well, it's kind of work in progress. And uh, ideally, we would like to do it uh, to, to see what is the, the, the effective error rate when you actually produce a quantum error correction um, gate or if unitary if you want, um, and trying to do like a full Hamiltonian analysis, but well, that, 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 is, that is kind of long, but we're still doing it, trying. And well, thank you very much. I hope you have some questions.
Questions? I have a quick question. One of the nice things about uh, quantum error correcting codes is that if you have a sparsity or locality in your error model, it will be reflected in your code. That is, your code will be nicer and smaller and everything will be better. But uh, with the moose that you have, the uh, scaling with the size of the, num with the number of qubits is still exponential, right? It is, uh, yeah, it is still exponential. Because in, if in you look at the first order uh, decoupling, you can exploit the locality of the uh, error model. Yes, but if you want to go to arbitrary order, I don't think you can. You don't think you can? No, because, um, well, so when we're, well, well, when we're doing that CDD um, thing, you see that even if, let's say you have a one local error model should be. So regardless of, even in this locality, there will be a Magnus term at some point that will be at least D local, right? Where D is the distance of your code. So that term you cannot deal with, even if you try to concatenate it more times in DD, because whatever, if you use just your stabilizer, let's say as your code, as your operator, it will always jump over it. So that term will still keep that order D, T to the D if you prefer. So that is like an inherit, I mean that's like a limitation you will have. Unless you use like the full stabilizer and logical thing. Time for one more question. Okay, if not, let's thank Harada again. Thank you. <laughs>